Good morning, First Baptist. Good morning. We start off with a wonderful song of praise, and then the next thing we want to do is prayer. So let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We have a chance to gather together in your name to show great praise and how wonderful you are, how great you are, how worthy you are as a lamb for what you've done for us. Father, we want to remember those who are unable to attend this morning, and we want to have them know that they are in our thoughts and prayers wherever they are, whether they're unable to make it here or whether they're at home at sick or somewhere. Just remember that we want, just because they are not here, that we are thinking of them. Father, we also want to remember all the things that you do for us all the way around the world, all the things that happen, that no matter what, you are there with us all the time. In your name, amen. Once again, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I wanted to say briefly before I get started uh, that uh, Miss Johnson had the opportunity to plant some flowers yesterday in the beautiful weather, okay? And that's, good thing about that is that we have God's nourishment, and that's the rain that comes in that's going to make it grow and for the deer to eat it. Uh, we, we don't have any way of presenting it, but there's nourishment for everybody, and one of those things that we can get nourishment is right here, listening to the word of God. It never goes away. It doesn't get eaten except it unless you devour it and want it and want to worship that. So we welcome you. Um, the first things first, uh, if you need a ride to this church, and we have a bus ministry, and you can call the church office at 931-359-4077. Also, if you're a visitor for the first time, we have a little pamphlet here, usually that's sitting right in front of you on the back of the pew. It looks something like this. It could be pink, it could be blue, it could be white. And it has a place where you can put your name and address so we can have a record of your attendance. So uh, also it has on there on the back of it if you have any prayer concerns that you would like to, to make note of. And then when you're done with it, you can put it in the offering plate as it comes around to you, or you can hand it to one of these gentlemen on the front row and we can have that, that record and pass it on. And uh, also, uh, those who are listening up there, uh, we want you to uh, remind you that if you're watching on truelife.org or, or any of the website or YouTube, uh, there's opportunities for us, for you to enjoy, to uh, participate, participate in our service if you like. Uh, several different ways, one is through the media and also, of course, if you want to come here at the church. Uh, and the next thing we want to do is we want to have our greeting. We want to stand up and enjoy each other's company. And remember, great, how great as thou art.
guys about something this morning I bet you all have. Pets. Do any of you have pets? Okay. I brought some pictures of mine. I got two cats that live outside. Anybody have cats? Some, some people don't like cats. Uh, and then I have a dog. There's a selfie she took with me and her. And you have dogs on your dress. That's cool. This is my grand puppy. Y'all don't have grand puppies yet. She will. You will. You'll have them before you have grandkids. And then I have some fish at school. I have all kinds of fish at school, and I love them too. And you know, some people have horses. Do we have anybody up here that has a horse? Yeah. I know you do. And you have horses on your dress this morning. Well, one thing about all of these animals, you have to take care of them, don't you? Somebody has to. Somebody has to make sure they have food and water and shelter and that they see the vet and they're taken care of, their health's good. Somebody has to take care of them. So, you know, that's kind of like somebody has to take care of us too, don't they? Did you know we have a shepherd that takes care of us? That's what you call the person that takes care of sheep. And sheep are not really smart animals. They can't take care of themselves. So some people might say, we were sheep. Uh-huh, you've got a bat on your shirt. I don't know anybody that has a bat as a pet, though. That'd be kind of... You have a bat? I don't think you do. I don't think you do. Let's see what the Bible says about the shepherd, though. In John, we read Jesus saying, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I would lay down my life for the sheep. I guess y'all know, he's not really talking about sheep. He's talking about us. And he would take, he would lay down his life for us. And he did, didn't he? When he went to the cross and died on that cross for us, he died for our sins. He did that just for us. And is there anything that you need that he's not taking care of? You have a home, you have your parents, you have school. Yeah, that's part of being taken care of. You have food to eat. You have a church you can come and worship in. He's the good shepherd. He takes care of us just like we have to take care of our pets. So let's say a prayer this morning. Our most kind and gracious Father, we praise you for being the good shepherd and watching over us, Lord, because we know we can't take care of ourselves, Lord. We have to be watched out for, and we know that you will always do that, Lord. I praise you for this wonderful day. I praise you for these children and and them coming to church and hearing your word, Lord. And I pray that, that if anyone here hears something today that touches their heart, I pray that they would act on that and let you be their good shepherd also. I ask these things in your name. Amen. Our scripture reading today is taken from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. It's page 1035 in your pew Bible. By this we know love, that he had laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are, that we are of the truth and reassurance our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if your heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. As we pray together today, let's everybody hold hands and uh, go boldly before the throne of grace, where we receive mercy and find grace to help. Our Father, we are a people who have gathered together in your presence. We're grateful for the invitation that you gave to us to come boldly to speak with you about things that matter to us and to 
discover what matters to you. We thank you for your good pleasure that you have made known to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we ask first of all that you let us behold your glory in saving us. Help us to see our salvation not as a, a something that you owe us, but as a way that you have worked to bring glory and honor and praise to your own name. Help us to be thankful and grateful for what you've done in saving us. We bow in awe of your glory. It's so brilliant we cannot stand to look at it long. We are aware of the reflected glory in all the world around us. We see your signature on the handwork of, of creation and on our, each of our lives. We recognize your presence and your power as we go about living day by day. Lift us up in our real, humble peace with you. We thank you that justified by faith, we have peace with you. We rejoice in hope of your glory, and not only that, we rejoice in our tribulations in life. Thank you for the peace that we have because Christ died for us. Grant that we may soar like eagles rather than walk like turkeys. Give us wings of divine strength, waves of inexplicable joy. Move us by the power of your spirit to engage in the kinds of things that will bring honor to your name, that will glorify you. May rivers of living water of your Holy Spirit flow from within us to fill the air that we breathe and to season our conversation with the world, to be with us as we interact with each other and as we engage in the quality of relationships that we have by being members of the body of Christ and family of God. Keep us in the glory that you have revealed through Jesus. Keep us in your love. Keep us in your power. Keep us as your treasure. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Please stand and sing blessed assurance. Jesus is mine.
As we prepare for our, our weekly offering, two things to keep in mind, our weekly budget, $7,485, and also as you see on your PowerPoint, the Andy Armstrong goal that we, we must remember, uh, $3,842. So if you will, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the goodness that you've given us. We take this moment and this time to give back a portion to you. You provided everything we needed for us at all times, and whenever it's needed, wherever it's needed. Everything we have is because of you, and we owe it to you, a small portion, to give back to you so that we can do all the things such as outreach for the things that we need to do for church as servants to you, to be servant for you, Lord, to do the things that, that will help other Christians and other people that are not Christian. We want to help them all. Father, so much work to do in our lives, so much to do daily, weekly, throughout our lives. We we'll always try to remember that, that everything we do is for you. In your name, amen. shall see Jesus just as he
Thank you, Charles, for singing for us this morning. I I'm sorry you couldn't get to that lower register that... Uh, Would you open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 4, and if you'll make your way to verse 5, then we'll read together in just a few moments. While you're finding Acts 4, 5, let me tell you about a couple of guys that I, I heard of. Uh, they together met in their hometown after being away at college and, and doing some things uh, separately. They were good friends during their high school years, graduated from high school there, in this little town, and, and so they decided that they would meet and come back uh, to reminisce, kind of catch up. You know, they were, they were doing something. Neither of them had married by this point, and so they, they decided they would take a week and go back to the hometown and do something. So each of them, having gone to a different college, had engaged in the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ. How many of you have heard of Campus Crusade? Uh, a lot of you have, and, and you know that one of the, one of the, uh, things that Campus Crusade does for the students that they minister to is help them learn how to share their faith with other people. And so they were impressed with this, uh, this responsibility that they felt, and they decided they wanted to go back home uh, to, uh, to share their faith for a week before they uh, got involved in, in new jobs and new activities in their lives. So they're together on mission, and they decided one evening to go to a local bar not to drink, but to go to the bar because that's where they felt like they would have the greatest opportunity, natural opportunities, uh, to engage in conversation and to talk to people about, about Christ. So they're there not drinking, and uh, uh, as they talked, a, a few people, you know, were listening to their story, and, and, th and they were politely tolerant of them. A, a couple of them appreciated what they're doing in, in much the same way that you might appreciate uh, two Latter-day Saints missionaries who knock on your door. Um, so sort of a mixed bag there. But, th but then you, you know, th admire them for doing something that most of us uh, would not do. But there was one guy that kept overhearing the conversation, and I think God works in the life of the one that often overhears and gets offended by what they're, they're hearing. And so he began to get a little belligerent in responding to them, though not talking directly to them, just kind of out loud. And, and before long, his, his hostility kind of escalated. And, and, and you know how things begin to happen like that. A little bit of pushing and shoving. The two guys kind of tried to back off and tried to, try to, try to calm the the angry guy, without, without retracting what they'd been talking about. And um, while this pushing and shoving was going on, just little stuff, you know, someone called the police. And the police showed up at this little bar, and, uh, well, you may not be surprised about life in our age today. Our two heroes were arrested for disturbing the peace. And they were taken to jail, and they were held to appear before the judge the next day. Now that's a story that um, kind of parallels what happens in Acts 3 and 4. And uh, two guys go up to the temple at the hour of prayer and they encounter a guy who is lame and uh, they provide healing to this guy and they begin to tell others that the reason this guy can walk is because Jesus was raised from the dead. They talk resurrection. And before long, here come the temple guards, and they're under arrest, and they're taken to, to jail while the, while the guys are going to judge them for what they've been doing. So we pick up their story with their defense before the judges as they're called to speak before, before the judges on that scene. Acts 4, verse 5 says... On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, 
said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing well before you. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Well, there's a statement of the simple, perfect gospel, that Jesus was killed by sinners. You can insert your name in there. No, you weren't there to physically nail Jesus to the cross, but it was your sin that put him on the cross. In essence, you helped kill Jesus, but God raised him from the dead. There's always a divine vindication that's a part of the perfect gospel and part of this simple truth that, that we proclaim, but the point that you need to get to beyond simply that Jesus died and rose again is that God gave him as the only source of salvation. God gave him as the only source of salvation. Verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So, what I'd like to do today is talk with you about what faith in Jesus does for you. It's practical, and it's sensible, and... Uh, uh, I'm going to draw all of my insights from Acts 3 and 4. And uh, in fact, um, um, I've provided a listening guide for you. Everybody have your listening guide in hand? I'm, I make these things. I want to make you use them, okay? All right. Everybody got a listening guide in hand? All right. I'm going to help you fill in the blanks at the outset here. So, you know, you can have that little task uh, accomplished, but what I want to do this morning is talk about the first three of those points and then come back together tonight to talk about the uh, four, uh, four through six, points four through six. So here's, here we go. Let's fill, out the, let's fill out the listening guide, and then you can take notes as, as we go along here. Number one, faith in Jesus prospers you more than money. That fits our age, doesn't it? We'll talk about that. Number two, faith in Jesus provides you greater wonder. And number three, faith in Jesus protects you from false faith. And number four, faith in Jesus portends greater health and wholeness for you. Number five, faith in Jesus proclaims a resurrection life for you. And number six, Faith in Jesus promotes a Holy Spirit-filled life. All right? Well, let's go back and uh, let's pick up number one. Faith in Jesus prospers you more than money. The guy at the temple needed money. That's clear from the text. He's brought there because he can't work. He's an invalid. He's never walked in all of his life. He's taken to the temple, outside the temple actually, and deposited there where people who come and go from the temple can give him money as he begs alms. He needed money. And, and really, there's not a lot wrong with money, is there? The Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. The Bible says it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. That's where we get ourselves into trouble, but how we get it, how we spend it, how we save it, but most of all, how we give it is an important matter uh, of concern in our lives. So we need to understand that. So what the guy was doing was what his religion had provided for him to do. And the people of, uh, of uh, the Jewish faith were kind of required to give alms to the poor. And so that's why the guy was at the temple. By the way, if you're an invalid, if there's something wrong with you, in this day and time, you cannot go into the temple. 
So he's deposited outside the worship center, outside the place where people go up to pray. He's on the outs here because he could defile the place because of his own uncleanness. So there's a stigma attached to his, to his being an invalid and being dropped at the temple there. The guy at the temple needed money, but he needed more than money, didn't he? He needed, um, he needed a new heart. He needed a new life. He, he needed, in a word, salvation. He needed a radical change that he could not produce in himself, that no other human being could produce in him. He needed a life that God himself could inject into him and make him whole. So Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now it becomes clear that when you read Acts 3 and 4, you're discovering that this is a salvation story. This is not simply the story of a healing that took place. This is more than that. This is the transformation of an individual that happens to be manifested in his, uh, in his uh, being healed from his disease. There's a connection in the scriptures in the New Testament between healing and salvation. So very often Jesus told those who were healed, your faith has saved you. And that's the language that Jesus used. So when a person puts their faith in Jesus for whatever purpose, then salvation accompanies, very often accompanies what, what we're searching for in Jesus. Now it becomes clear that it's a salvation story uh, because throughout the story we're seeing a changed person. And we're seeing an occasion for witness and we're seeing God vindicate his spokesman by the miracle that was performed there. This is a salvation story. This is not just a story of a healing. This is not just a how to get what you want from God kind of a story. The prosperity gospelers miss the point if that's what they see in this. Not how we get from God what we want. How we get from God what he wants to give us is more, is more like it. Now, how much more important is receiving the gift of God that is eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ than whatever stuff we might accumulate in the world. Jesus asked a very, very important question of his disciples and of some people that were challenging him on one occasion. He said, what will be your profit if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? That's a good question. That's a great consideration for us today. That's an especially great consideration for young people. When the world looks so great and you feel so bulletproof right now and life is wonderful and all kinds of opportunity before you, let's not forget there's more to life than what you can acquire in this world. Be sure your faith is in Jesus, that's my point. We're already discovering, we're already discovering that the more we work with uh, young people, children and youth in particular, we're discovering that very often the ones who prevent those children and those youth from going forward with Christ is their parents. I don't know all the reasons why that happens, but sometimes adults get in the way of young people planting their lives in Christ and growing and flourishing as believers in Jesus. So I want to say to the children and the youth of this church, be sure that your faith is in Jesus Put your faith in him. Trust in him. Number one, faith in Jesus prospers you more than money. Number two, faith in Jesus provides you greater wonder. The lame man was surprised by grace. He expected to get an offering, uh, alms given to him, but he got something different. And he was Shocked by it, stunned by it, astounded by this thing. In fact, when Peter lifted him up, took him by the hand, and raised him to his feet, this guy started walking around. He'd never done that before. He started jumping up and down. He'd never done that before. He started hooping and hollering and carrying on. And you know what he did? He did something else he'd never done before. He went into the temple at the time of prayer. 
for the first time in his life, he's included in the congregation, in the community of God's people. Can you imagine what that must have felt like if he understood that that was the reality that uh, was unfolding for him? Uh, he had always begged for help. He'd always depended on someone else to get him from where he was to where he needed to be. But see him leaping and jumping and celebrating and praising God and enjoying his new life in Christ. I told you this was a salvation story. And notice that others are described with words like wonder and amazed and astounded. All those words talk about how other people saw what was going on with this guy, how it was impacting them. It opened their eyes to to some powers and some activities and to some realities that they would had gotten used to perhaps and begun to take for granted. Now they're seeing something and their aston astonishment is, is what's drawing them to the possibility of, uh, of God working in their own lives in a very special way. So the lame man was surprised by grace and the people around him were surprised by what God was doing in his life. Remember, people... people Remember, Peter had told him, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He had said, this Jesus is the one who gives you the power to do that. And the effect on the man was both physical and spiritual. Let's not forget the spiritual dimension of what took place in his life. Two thieves hung on crosses beside Jesus. You know this story. One railed against his condition, against his circumstance in life against the dumb luck he got caught and now he's found himself on a cross and he's dying for the crime that he committed the other one admitted out loud in front of Jesus and all the people who were gathered there we deserve what we're getting he tried to cal uh, calm the other guy down to no avail so it is with all of us as we face our final judgment we deserve what we get if we face the judgment without faith in Christ. We'll deserve to die, to be separated from God forever. That's what hell is all about. And that's our default position until we come to faith in Christ, until you make a deliberate choice to embrace Jesus as your Savior, then you default to hell. Don't do that. That's not wise. That's not good. That's, that's an unholy alternative that you don't need to exercise in your life. One saw no hope. I'm not going to come down off of this cross. So he complained and railed and reviled and, and cussed and carried on on that cross as long as he was alive. The other saw Jesus said something amazing. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. There's no other hope for him. The only hope available to him is if Jesus is who he says he is. And if Jesus can do what he said he would do, that's his only hope. He has no desire to come off of that cross. He knows that's the end of his earthly life. But he sees Jesus and that's his only hope. And he hears Jesus say the astounding and amazing and wonderful thing that all of us need to hear. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that a good word? Isn't that a great word? Don't you want to go through life with that sense, with that, that assurance that today, if today's the day, if today's your day, you'll be with Jesus forever? Don't you want to have that, that kind of confidence as you go about living your life? That, that everything has been settled and all the issues have been dealt with and there's nothing that separates you from a, a, a life with God and that right now, right now, your next stop is going to be heaven. Not the graveyard, not the cemetery, but heaven itself. That's your next place of journey. Well, you can have that assurance. You can have that confidence if you'll simply believe in Jesus. That's one of the things that trusting in Jesus will do for you. Nancy Spielberg and Dorothy Purdy write in a, a fanfare, a celebration of belief, a little thing called, If I Had Only Known You. They write, Lord, I crawled across barrenness 
to you with my empty cup. Uncertain in asking any small drop of refreshment. If only, if only I had known you better, I'd have come running with a bucket. I like that. If we only knew who Jesus is and what he can be to us, we wouldn't be satisfied with a thimble full of grace. We would want a bucket load. We would want to be drenched in it. We would want to just be covered by it. We would want it all over us and all within us if we just knew who Jesus is. Number one, faith in Jesus prospers you more than money. Number two, faith in Jesus provides you greater wonder. Number three, faith in Jesus protects you from false faith. This might be a good place to, to, to wind up here, and so I think I will. I planned on doing this. A university professor once boasted, quote, one of my callings in life is to shatter the faith of naive fundamentalists as they come to my class. Just give me a room of young, naive evangelicals and let me at them. You can just watch them drop like flies, hit with raid when I challenge their faith in deliberate, consistent manner. There are a couple of issues that emerge from this confession of a, of a professor that, that likes to target young Christian people. Uh, one of those is that he thinks he knows more than those young Christians know, and in fact he probably does about his side of that argument the other side of that coin is that these young christians who go off to college very often don't know what they believe or why they believe it that's a challenge here and we're not even having to wait for that to take place when they get to the college campus now because by the time young people turn 18 by the time they graduate from high school 70 to 80% of them will drop out of church and not return. Does that mean something wrong with church? No, not necessarily that. It means something wrong with the Christian faith? No, nothing wrong with the Christian faith. It works. It brings salvation to us. It changes our lives. It makes us, makes us whole. But something happens in the communication of that gospel so that we can become very cavalier and complacent about what our church is and about what our faith is all about. That's the problem here. We're not ready to speak up in defense of this faith that we have. The antagonists in this story are the Sadducees. The Sadducees, they're the, the liberals of their day. They're known more for what they do not believe like, they do not believe in miracles. They do not believe in resurrection. In fact, whenever they get with the Pharisees who happen to believe in miracles and, and resurrection, if, if that subject comes up, then they turn on each other. The Pharisees and the Sadducees will fight each other over this particular issue. And so the Sadducees are there. For them, life is only now. Life is only what you can get in this world. There's nothing more. Life is now. That's, that's what the Sadducees believe. Well, that's... You know why they call them Sadducees? Well, they don't believe in anything. And they think this life is the only thing, so they, they're sad, you see? Fourteen years of seminary. <laughs> Just to tell that joke. But there's truth in it. There's an abundance of false faith out there now. Some of them with the moniker Christian plastered across the top of them. Uh, an abundance of false faith that, that um, I believe will fall by the wayside when we come to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus supplants all the rest of that, all the rest of that stuff. It, it, it raises genuine Christian faith to a level that no other religious activity can bring us. It is the heart and soul of what our faith is all about, that Jesus really died, was buried, and raised from the dead on the third day. That's the simplicity of the gospel. But if you somehow explain away the death and resurrection of Jesus, as false faiths tend to do, 
or misapply the meaning of death and resurrection as false faiths tend to do, then you lose the significance of what genuine Christianity is really all about. Remember what Peter said, verse 12 of chapter 4, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Writer of Ecclesiastes came to a desperate conclusion about the meaning of life. He decided everything is for nothing. That's the theme of his little book, the book of Ecclesiastes. Everything is for nothing. He tried pursuing wisdom. He tried self-indulgence. He tried hard labor. Uh, I call that workaholism. He tried wealth and honor. He tried all kinds of things. He pointed his ship in all kinds of directions and sailed on and found nothing there. He discovered that death comes to all people. Whether you're good or bad, whether you're young or old, death happens and And that was disturbing to him. So he said, enjoy life with the one you love. Enjoy life as best you can. He said, the pursuit of real wisdom is better than folly, but that doesn't mean that it's worth anything after all because both wise and foolish die in the end. He said, become a giving person. Maybe that will help you. But at the end of the little book of Ecclesiastes, most of all, he said, remember the Lord while you're young. Fear God and keep his commandments. Don't wait. Don't put this off. Trust in Jesus. Trust in Christ. I ask you my own question. What good is life without Christ? I mean, what good is it without Christ? I mean, it'll end. And it'll not end good without Christ. But let me ask another question, though. What good is a Christ who is no more than the best you can get from this world. That's not the real Jesus, is it? Trust Christ. Put your faith in him. Embrace Jesus. Take him personally. Enjoy the life that he imparts to you. There is salvation in no one else but him. Let us pray. Our Father, we bow in your presence. We give you thanks and praise for your good word to us. We thank you for the invitation that you extended to all of us to come to you. We thank you for the grace and mercy and peace that we find in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have called us to yourself and we can answer very quickly and say, I believe. Father, I pray that every person who hears my voice even now will put their faith in Jesus for the salvation, the real salvation that you alone can provide. And I pray that you'll bless this time of invitation that some in this place may respond with hearts of faith as you call their name. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song, the song of of our invitation.